Hi, and welcome to module three of lecture 10. Now in the previous module, we dealt with a lot of different examples of vector operations, rather operations on vectors. So we dealt with vector addition and vector subtraction and scalar multiplication, which was the multiplication of a scalar times a vector, vector length, um, stuff like that. What we did not do is deal with vector multiplication, by which we mean multiplying a vector by another vector. Now, the reason we didn't do it then was because um, it turns out multiplying vectors is a little more tricky than multiplying scalars or multiplying a scalar times a vector. And the reason is there's more than one way you might think about multiplying vectors. In a sort of broader class is one way you can multiply vectors would produce a scalar. That's the one we're going to talk about um, here and the only one that's really used in, in political science and that's called a scalar product. That produces a scalar, um, so not a vector. There are other ways of multiplying vectors um, that produce other vectors. A common one of use in other fields, um, like physics for, for instance, is the cross product. The cross product um, produces a vector that's perpendicular to the two vectors um, you're crossing. But we're not going to talk about that at all because um, it never comes up in political science or I think any social science that I know of. Um, it might come up a little bit in some ways of looking at stats if you do it purely geometrically, but that's way beyond the scope of this class. So we're going to focus on the scalar product, which comes up much more often. The scalar product is often also known as the dot product. It's called the dot product because the operator is a dot. <laughs> so if this is vector a and vector b, the dot product is read a dot b. There you go. There are other ways of writing this. The scalar product is sometimes written like this, with brackets around it to the straight scalar product. We will, in general, use this exclusively. Um, so there you go. That's the dot product. Now, despite all this nomenclature and stuff, the dot product is actually relatively straightforward. The general function, the general operation looks like this. The sum over i of a i b i. So you take each, the first component of A times the first component of B, you multiply them, you add that product to the second component of A times the second component of B, and so on and so forth. So this looks like this. That's a dot, dot, dot. I just wasn't actually registering. <laughs> so there you go. That's the dot product in general. Um, if you want an example, if we have the vector a over here, and that's, um, here we'll, we'll keep it the old uh, 1, 2, 2, 1 thing. So there's a and b. a dot b would be equal to 1 times 2 plus 2 times 1 equals 4. So the dot product of a and b here is 4. Um, and that's all there is to the dot product at all. There's literally nothing else there. I shouldn't say that. That's, that's all there is to calculating the dot product. Um, interpretation, there's a little more to it. So let's get to that. Um, the dot product, the point of the dot product is to look at projection. It's to figure out what the um, sort of the, the amount of vector A that's in the same line as vector B. So if we um, with the shadow of vector A on vector B, how long would that shadow be? Let's just do a more concrete example here. So let's take um, start by taking a vector A. I'll make it horizontal for the purpose of this example. And a vector B. And if the goal is to understand how B projects onto A, so the part of B that is the same line as A, one way to address this is by dropping a perpendicular line from B. So we do that carefully. Okay, there's not should be a line, and this is perpendicular. And that causes this triangle to be a 90, a 90 degree triangle, a right triangle. Let's call this angle theta, which is the angle between the vectors A and B. Then this over here is B cosine 
So the part of B that's in the same line as A is B cosine theta. Now it turns out the same argument applies whether or not A is horizontal. Um, you could rotate the entire thing this way. It would still be just fine. If theta is the angle between the two vectors A and B when placed tail to tail, then the dot product ends up being the part of the one vector that's in the same line as the other vector, B cosine A, where this double line, remember that's the, that's the, that's the um, length of B, it's the norm of B, times the vector A itself, the norm of the vector A itself. In other words, A dot B is equal to this, which is equal to the norms of A and B multiplied times cosine theta. That's works in two dimensions, um, but the intuition holds more generally. In two dimensions, it's just a projection of the one vector onto the other one multiplied by that vector's length. That gives you the dot product of A and B. Um, in general, that's true too in more than two dimensions. If you could imagine a vector in more than two dimensions, you know, rotating around, the projection of one on the other is what we're looking for when we deal with the, cross, the dot product. This relates to something called the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, which I'm not going to write in detail. It's in the book. Um, but since the cosine of theta is less than or equal to 1, then we see that A dot B, absolute value, is less than or equal to um, the, multi the, the multiplied lengths. Um, because the actual, because you're looking only at the projection and not the total lengths. That's the cauchy schwartz inequality. Anyway, um, when this has come up most of all, what well, comes up most of all when you're trying to understand the relationship of two vectors, in particular, are they perpendicular? Note that, remember your trig trigonometry from way back when, um, if theta goes to 90 degrees, right, pi over 2, if theta goes to 90 degrees, so it's vertical here, then you can see from the picture that which would um, happen, this would be B and this would be A, this would be 90 degrees, and there would be no part of B that's in the same line as A. There'd be no part of B at all that's in the same line as A, and therefore the dot product would be zero. The cosine of 90 degrees is zero, and the dot product of A and B, when they're separated by 90 degrees, is also zero. So the dot product can provide a convenient way to show you very quickly if two very general vectors are perpendicular or not. Um, why do we care about perpendicular? Um, we'll talk more about this in, in the next lecture, but we can do a little bit um, now just to give you a sense of what's going on. One way of representing space is through the axes, right? You've dealt with it before. There's the x-axis, it's horizontal, the y-axis, which is vertical. In three dimensions, there's a z-axis, which goes out of the page. You would keep going. Each of these axes is really a vector, right? Can be spanned, we'll say, by, by a vector. And we can make up vectors like E1, which in two dimensions would be 1, 0, and E2, which would be 0, 1. And you can make any vector you want in two dimensions by multiplying something times, multiplying a scalar times E1, and adding a scalar times E2, and you get any vector you want. This would deal with much more in the next lecture. But the point is, those two vectors have a dot product of zero. One times zero is zero, plus zero times one is zero. So the dot product is zero, they're perpendicular, and using these perpendicular vectors, we're able to provide um, what's called orthogonal spanning vectors. And this stuff all comes up a whole bunch we try to figure out what the space looks like. Um, it also helps understand in independence. So for instance, ideally, you'd have as um, non-linear um, data as you could get, as you, as you can get. So for instance, if you're trying to describe something with independent variables, and you have two different independent variables, you don't want them to be the exact same variable. You don't want to include it in a regression, as you'll find out in your stats class, um, two vectors of independent variables, say, um, 
x1 equals 1, 4, 3, and x2 equals 1, 4, 3. You don't want that. In fact, you also don't want an x2 that's equal to 2, 8, 6. That's longer, but in the same exact line as the first one. Why? Well, in some, case, in some senses, both of your independent variables have the exact same variation. <laughs> um, so they're really, in some sense, the same thing. <laughs> and including two of the exact same or close to the same independent variable gives you the problem of multicollinearity, which is an issue when trying to do regression or understand your um, regression analysis, your linear model, and therefore we don't want to do that. Using the dot product can help us understand whether or not um, whether or not it's okay to do, whether or not you're doing that right, whether or not these two vectors are actually um, collinear, whether or not the, whether or not they're actually in the same line, right? Because if the dot product is zero, the perpendicular, that's good. If they're if it's non-zero, the more it's non-zero, right? The more it equals it equals the more the dot product goes to the the um the, most, the product of the lengths of each vector, the more you're in trouble. So this is one way to sort of test that out and see how how collinear the two different vectors are. In general, um, vectors are used as say, often for stats. They can represent data, whether independent variables or dependent variables. It's also used in game theory pretty often, which we didn't talk about as much. So for instance, if we're trying to understand um, multiple actors' solutions, and we want to talk about a best response, or not sorry, not a best response, but an equilibrium, and we have two actors, we often assume that the equilibrium action is a vector corresponding to the action of player one, I should put a star there, and the action of player two, both in equilibrium. And writing as a vector helps us well, solve these things, but also um, deal with them properly and keep track of them properly. And there are other uses of vectors as well in dealing with um, game theory, as you'll see in your game theory class. But these things come up pretty often, um, and it's good to have a sense of how to actually go about manipulating them. So that's it for vectors for now. We're going to turn in the next module to matrices. Thank you very much.